Say good morning to everybody. Good morning. Uh, we are representing the uh, New Jersey Association of Black Educators. I'll have Ron introduce himself. Speaking, got to speak into the mic. Uh, good morning. My name is Ronald Sullivan, Dr. Ronald Sullivan. I am with the New Jersey Association of Black Educators. I'm part of the uh, Educational Adv Advocacy Committee. Unfortunately, uh, you may have been expecting James Harris. He was unfortunately called away on a family emergency, so he asked myself and Dr. Pritchard if we would stand in for him. Please don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> uh, Doctor, we're going to have a sort of a back and forth workshop here. Dr. Pritchard will be presenting the uh, unpacking of racism in the American educational system. I will be talking about the Amistad legislation. And so, and then Dr. Pritchett will come back with a short wrap up. So that's the way we're gonna work to do the workshop. And after that, we will leave time for you to have a Q&A session. Okay, for me, fine with everyone? Okay, um, so that there's no distraction, if it gets too warm, we can open it again. But would someone please uh, be so kind as to close the door, please? as long as our title is on the, I mean, Yeah, it is. Workshop. It is. It is. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Forrest Pritchard. Bless you. I always like to remind people I was raised by Southern women and down in Atlantic City, New Jersey, before I left for Delaware State during the uh, civil rights period of the 60s. But whenever I came home, my mama would always say, leave your boy, leave your titles outside the door. Well, and he's my baby boy, so I have to give deference to that model that brought us all up. And I'm going to say, uh, I know I got credentials for being here today, in a sense, because um, Dr. Sharnay Brown, the coordinator for this entire event, is a Seton Hall graduate. And I was even, you know, I, I mentored those young people as best we could, you know, at we call PWIs, predominantly white institutions. We tried to give them a family-like atmosphere as we could to really support their, not only their academics, but their spirit, their souls, and their bodies. And I was there years later when she defended her PhD dissertation also. So I just say that uh, that's my introduction uh, to all of you today. So fundamentally, I will say the first third of what we're going to do, as you can see, a prototype on the wall, is going to be a, 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 a timeline that uh, we'll look at the most critical legal cases and challenges to race and education in the country. Um, so that, we wish, should you wish to take notes on that uh, and so forth. Uh, but that's going to be the first part before we move to the legislation of Amistad. And then I'll bring us up to the current period. Um, so without further ado, um, I tried to uh, put in bold print uh, key points and the, the bullet points for each of the time periods. F fundamentally, what we deal with in higher education uh, today, I'm at Seton Hall University, by the way. Um, I've been in higher ed in New Jersey over 50 years. And um, I always like to give credit where credit is due, because when I left Atlantic City, I just wanted to be a middle school teacher in 1961. We actually, the gang I would hang with, the brothers, we all wanted to be teachers. We applied to all of the state teachers' colleges in Jersey at that point in time. Not one of us got in. We knew our credentials, you know, for, for getting into college were appropriate. Then we, then that's how we got to the revelation of understanding. Oh, that's why so many people we know from Lang City go to Lincoln, Morgan, Howard, Hampton. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we end up uh, in that kind of a circumstance. Three weeks later, some of us, including myself, are involved in sit-in demonstrations. Because most of us had never traveled in our lives. I'm at Delaware. I had no idea. I thought Delaware was near north, so to speak, and it was upper south. Please smile when I <laughs> give you that one. But we were in town buying our books and pencils, and we wanted to see what the capital of Delaware looked like. And um, one of the things I remember from that day, for example, was right in front of the state capitol, they had something, I, all I can do, I call it the stockade. If you were a bad person back in the day, the colonial period, they would make you 
sit on a board. They put, you put your hands and your feet out. They lock them into these boards with chains, and you sit there, I guess, for 24 hours. So you could be publicly humiliated. That was our first impression. We go down to the Woolworths after two hours and attempted to buy our little books and pencils. And this very, very polite waitress said, you do know you have to take this stuff outside, right, and to eat it. And we thought she was joking because she was so polite. She was not mean or anything. But that was our introduction to race, if you would, and beyond Atlantic City. But then I say this because if you all are educators, the expectation of our faculty, we, were, we saw ourselves, myself, as a very average kind of a person. I ran track with more proficiency than I handled my books. I just had a minimally B average. I just wanted to get into college and get a track scholarship. Uh, that's all. I, I knew I, I admit this because I tell my students this every day when they wonder why I push them so much. Because uh, I ended up in Delaware State's first ever honors program. I didn't even apply for it. They simply gave us a placement test. And because perhaps we came out of northern high schools, some of us had scores which compared to the overall population put us into the top 30 students in the freshman class of 1965. And after that, all hell started breaking loose because these professors came at us, and my last comment. In this program one day, the professor asked us, what was um, the greatest threat to America? And, and keep in mind now, we're coming out of the 50s where they used to have these periodic air raids because the Russians were about to invade America with atomic bombs, much like they are today in Ukraine. And uh, that was my response, among others. I said, well, my response was, um, it's the Russians with an atomic bomb. My professor said, no, it's not. He said, it's a black man or woman with a college degree who loves God. And my response was, damn. And that's when our education began, folks. He said, because you are the ones who have survived to get here. They don't want you to even get out of here. And you're going to be dangerous. So with that in mind, that's my introduction to race and education. Uh, you all are the ones who can save, save the minds of our children. You know, there's an African proverb. When other uh, villages would come raiding on each other in, in, in the African continent, one of the first things in their mind was not to say, let's save the king. The first statement they would make is, let's save, save the children. Whatever you do, save the children. Think about Rosewood, Florida, if you know the story. When that, that rampage started and, and the folks could see what was happening, they, they rounded up all the children, got them on that train, folks. Just remember that. So if you're in education, whether you're in the community or in schools, save the children. So by dates, by j dates, even going back to the colonial period, when people get sick and tired of us talking about race and education, we're talking about a struggle that goes back hundreds of years. Thomas Jefferson uh, in 1779, uh, this is a direct quote uh, when he comes up with his paradigm for education. He talks about there's only two groups of people, the laboring class and the learned class. And he talks about, you know, only ranking uh, and, uh, a few geniuses and separate them from the rubbish. Moving over to 1805, uh, the Lancaster model, which is about separating, once again, children, and, but, look, but looking at the words discipline and obedience. If you read this for yourself, please. So fundamentally, what you're going to see happening here is that there's a trend, I think, where uh, schools and even colleges are really about serving, not schools now, they're about serving a private good, as I call it. Just like you go to the grocery store to get your groceries. That means everybody needs groceries. But education in America is conceived by the ruling class as a service only available to, we'll say, the, the private or the upper class in America. You follow that? Not for the, um, we'll say, anyone else. Uh, 1830s, look, look, I said, look in the emboldened prints. Laws forbidding teaching of enslaved people to read and write. Uh, many of my students to this very day, particularly the, the white students who have no knowledge of these kind of things, doubt this kind of information. Moving into the 1840s, an emphasis on the Protestant curriculum. So even among classes of people, you know, there's a religious, the religious wars, if you would. I teach at a Catholic university. Uh, the first university in America was started in 1636. It was Harvard. White male Protestant was the criteria for entry. 
It was 200 years later before you began to get even colleges for non-Protestants, women, for Catholics, uh, for the Negro. <laughs> 1848, reform schools, the root of the concept reform schools. Look at it carefully if you would. Eighteen fifty two. California legislature passes a bill barring African American children from schools. So obviously eighteen fifty two you get a few I keep in mind another general point is that most of us think that at some point in time all African people of African descent were enslaved. Well even at the height of the Emancipation Proclamation period. Only 90% of our population were enslaved at that point, 10% had been freed. Have we got that? So at the point when that was implemented, um, those are the statistics. I might also add, if you ever read the Emancipation, this is a great exercise in the community school in your programs, Re actually read the Emancipation Proclamation, because I got any, I got sad news for anybody who currently <laughs> lives in New Jersey. You know, when you read the document, it simply says, I, the president, I'm freeing all of those enslaved in the areas which are in rebellion against the United States of America, which meant you know, that's all the southern states. So if you were enslaved in New York and New Jersey, that means we are technically, we need to be liberated, folks. That's where we need educators like you all. Amen. 1864 relative to the millions of people who were here before that little boat pulled up in Virginia, 1619. Millions of people were here. They didn't have 50 states. They had 500 tribal nations, folks. So look, under 1864, their mo our motto as a nation, shamefully, was kill the Indian in you and we save the man, which is a new euphemism for man and woman. They set up these boarding schools, and if you are paying attention to the current news, uh, you know that even from last summer, they found uh, behind one of the boarding schools in Canada hundreds of mass graves where these kids were, didn't die as adults, they were dying as children. And even the Catholic Church is somewhat um, responsible for a lot of that. 1800. The, the infamous 18... 1896, 30 years literally after the Emancipation Proclamation and our movement into Juneteenth, in the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. The grandfather clause comes in the early uh, 1900s. Um, race, 1905, California once again. You know how the Chinese got into California. When you go back about 100 years, they were building the Transcontinental Railroad. They didn't have a source of cheap labor on the West Coast. They had a source on the East Coast. They went down south. This is how part of my mother's family got up here. They would put flyers on trees. Colored men come north, come to this address, get jobs for the railroad, good wages. They did not have a lot. So that was the, the pool of cheap labor on the East Coast that allowed all the development. On the West Coast, they didn't have it. So I think entrepreneurs manipulated congressmen. They got laws passed to allow uh, unlimited migration of Chinese. Millions of uh, men came over. After they built the railroad, they wanted to kick them out of the country, by the way, through the Chinese Exclusion Act. So for decades, you're going to see um, California wrestled with the issue of race around the Chinese, Asians, Mexicans, and so forth. I often, I'll ask this group, who was Cesar Chavez? He's not a boxer, by the way, not that one. Any farm workers, organizing them. Just want to make sure, because I want to make sure my, my sense Seton Hall, as of this year, one-third of our entering class of 1,600 students were Latino. I said, do you know your history? Because it's one thing to have numbers. If you don't have power behind that, uh, as Elijah Muhammad would say, the devil is just going to take you out real quick. <laughs> you got to know your history. Because numbers alone will not give you power in America. All right, we're going to move 
quickly as we're doing pretty good, I think, on time. I know, 10 minutes. NAACP has two major divisions. As some of you might know if you're members, one division is uh, where they have local units. They have over 2,000 units where citizens can become civically engaged. The other unit is just lawyers. It's a civil rights division. That unit is in court every day. And as we all know from the infamous Brown versus the Board of Education class, a case, uh, it takes lawyers, Thurgood Marshall. You know, when those brothers were in Howard University Law School, how did, how did Thurgood Marshall even get to Howard University Law School? Well, he applied to the University of Maryland first, that we're not going to admit Negroes at all, race and education again. These brothers would, from what I, when you read his book, they would sit in Howard's uh, little, wherever they could get their coffee and sit and drink. And they, before they even graduated, they were putting models together about how they were going to use the law to change America. So I used that model, too, to ask young people at the university, what are you all talking about in your spare time? Do you have any spare time other than TikToking and name dropping? <laughs> Don't get distracted by your toys. Use them to organize. GI, the GI Bill, the World War II, uh, kept a lot of colleges in America during the Depression, kept them open. Harvard University overnight became 90% uh, people who could simply pay G with the GI Bill money. I just share that because when schools need to integrate, uh, Harvard, like many other places, if they were going to stay in business during that, that troubling time, they did it. 19, look at 1948. Educational Testing Service, which has, you know, total control in a sense over the AP exams, uh, the college boards, even when we get ready for graduate school. The office that says they're the Graduate Records Office. That's the one that controls the test for graduate schools. Look further into my, the analysis there. Even the SAT test. Look at the name Carl Brigham. Anybody ever heard of the eugenics movement in terms of race? Thank you. I see more than half the heads. I have, the other half didn't move. Eugenics is a, a nice, it's a scientific approach to race purification and race destruction. Martin Luther King once said, by the way, everything Hitler did was legal. Does anybody know why it was legal in my class this morning? <laughs> of course, you could say the Hit Hitler and the National Socialist Party passed laws. Do you know where they copied those laws from? You can do this. The United States of America. States like California had laws that if you were born, if you were considered feeble-minded, they wanted to sterilize you so you wouldn't replicate. Yes, sir. It's all, all in there. And um, so I say bear this in mind because as Dr. Bell, as we will get to him later, all of Dr. Bell wanted law students to understand it was that law in America has been written and specifically includes the name of the Negro. In other words, I'll get to that point later. We call it the immigrant analogy. Uh, the infamous 1954 um, Brown versus the Board of Ed. But once again, that, that is not just one simple moment. It took decades to roll into that. People who were, were uh, going into the South, taking pictures, this is before Thurgood, taking pictures of the Negro schools to show that separate but equal was not equal at all. So they produ provided documentary evidence that white schools in the same town did not look like the Negro schools. That's another little technique. We can use all the skill. We need teachers, photojournalists, documentary filmmakers. Everybody follow that? You need activists on the street. All of that working together like a symphony to bring about change in the issue of race and education. Uh, little Rock, Arkansas, the Little Rock Nine. 1957. Uh, we're coming up on the anniversary in a few more weeks, right around Thanksgiving. I was a junior in college when the first Catholic president, the youngest president in U.S. history, was assassinated. I only mention that because immediately, you know, when Kennedy went into office, he didn't want to, the federal government had no real role in civil rights in a, in a specific sense. 
And so Kennedy was a little bit hesitant about speaking publicly. Matter of fact, even on occasion, they had a little problem even with the uh, March on Washington, which had occurred, as you remember, in August of 63. Um, they really tried to get the labor movement and the civil rights movement not to come together. Uh, and, and also, don't forget that that movement, the civil rights movement of 63, called the March on Washington, was not generated nor stimulated by the civil rights movement. It was the labor movement, A. Philip Randolph and those who had already been you know, marching for years in Washington, D.C. So that represented a fusion of two movements, which really frightened the heck out of people in Washington in the sense of that, that kind of power that represented. That's, a, that's an important teaching point. Now, this is just a series of, um, of cases that almost brings us up to the present. But if I reflect back on uh, the Kennedy moment, since television was becoming a, an important media at the time, a lot of the civil rights activity could be picked up by local news. And when he did, much like the parallel between then and today, when you can actually see George Floyd on the ground losing his air with, with that, okay, with cell phone video. So the parallel would be also that media was making and giving people insight to something they had never really seen before, only read about newspapers. You could actually see in real time what was happening in many of these cities as a part of the civil rights demonstrations. And Kennedy, as you may recall, knew that the entire nation should have been embarrassed. And he goes on TV and he makes a speech with, which indicates that Negroes are U.S. citizens like everybody else. They have the right uh, to do what they do in terms of the area of protesting. So that when he was assassinated, for many of us, the first thing we thought, without knowing much about his other political context, we thought was because of his stance on civil rights. That was our take as youngsters trying to understand life in America and race and so forth. Uh, look at 1994, Proposition 187 passes in California, making it illegal for children of undocumented immigrants to even attend public schools. I might add uh, one other thing I didn't emphasize, but it was in there if you saw it. Um, at some point in time, you know, after the uh, releasing of through the Emancipation Proclamation, it was really by the late 1800s, it was the movement of colored activists, Negro activists, who um, really fundamentally got in, in, in the South, they got uh, public laws passed that would actually create public schools. So in other words, education at that point, if you're looking at education for everybody, more white students attended private schools. So that for some of us, we come to the conclusion, literally, that if it weren't for the struggle of poor little black folks, you would not have public education in America today. So once again, you must understand the premise of that. It just deals with looking at the laws that were being implemented. Uh, bringing it up to the, the 21st century, uh, no child left behind and all of its ramifications, which, you know, schools were to be held accountable for student achievement levels and provided penalties for schools. That's 2001. And you see I highlighted what happened in New Jersey in 2002, which is fundamentally on August the 27th, the governor signed into law the Amistad Bill, sponsored by Assemblyman Payne and Greg Stanley, the bill created the Amistad Commission in the honor of the enslaved Africans who gained their freedom after overthrowing the crew of the slave ship Amistad in 1839. I don't know if everyone knows the story. I don't know if brother wants to tell that story, but here you see a, uh, a graphic image of the Amistad ship. So I'm gonna get a little interaction here. Anybody got any ideas why that little rebellion of the, the men were able to pull their chains that were, uh, uh, I guess I'll say, I can't say welded into the, but they were able to break the bolts that had their chains into the wood. Does anybody, anybody know any characteristics of the Amistad ship compared to any other slave ship? Because this is, a, I think, a, something worth noting. There was something in their favor. 
this was not a regular slaver, as we, we say slaver in quotes. Sl this wasn't, ship wasn't built for slavery and, 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 and transporting bodies. It was built for cargo. So they simply modified it. You know, when you get aftermarket stuff in your car, like you want a, uh, what, what's it called, like a uh, remote switch. So they simply retrofitted a commerce ship to hold the body. So they simply had screwed in and pounded in nails and with the chains on it. So these brothers, being pretty, um, pretty smart, were able to work those chains out of there. They took over the ship. Uh, this goes on to be another legal case. Uh, they, they ordered, in case you're not familiar with um, the incident, they ordered the captain to take the ship back to uh, Africa. The ship was owned by Cubans. And um, for the most part, he had the ship circulating in the waters off of Connecticut. The U.S. Navy seeing the ship went out and confiscated it. Uh, the Cuban government uh, brought up a legal case. They wanted their property back. And the U.S. said, uh, after investigation, this is not property. These people were stolen from Africa. A uh, famous case, that case in American judicial hearings was argued up to the Supreme Court. Uh, they found in favor of the Africans that had been stolen and ordered that they be returned to Africa, except the government did not pass any other bills to allow, uh, put them, make the money available to get them back to Africa. Uh, and then the last case, which once again involves the West Coast. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ron, and Ron's going to talk about what happened in New Jersey with that. Okay, one, we like to fast forward. I'd like to fast forward to today, okay? I don't have any PowerPoint for you. Uh, as I said before, I was just pressed into service two days ago. So just bear with me, please. Uh, the Amistad legislation was originally signed into law and passed by the New Jersey State Senate and the New Jersey General Assembly and signed into law in 2002 under Governor McGreevy, Jim McGreevy. The revisions to the Amistad law incorporating the Amistad Commission took place by the State Senate and the State Assembly in January 2022. The Amistad Commission, so named, was in honor of the group of enslaved Africans led by John Sinkay, who, while being transported in 1839, on a vessel named the Amistad gained their freedom after overthrowing the crew of that ship and eventually having their case argued before the United States Supreme Court. And the law is established and created uh, in the executive branch of the state of New Jersey. I must have it reiterated and I must have you understand and I must emphasize this point that the New Jersey Amistad law is the law within New Jersey. It's under the mandate for implementation by the New Jersey State Department of Education. The New Jersey Amistad Commission under this legislation is charged with the responsibility to monitor and, and assess the inclusion of such materials and curricula in the state's educational system and take those steps necessary as the State Board of Education for the expansion of content about the slave trade, about American slavery education, and African American history presently being incorporated into the core curriculum standards. The legislation finds and it declares that since the days of slavery, public school curricula have consistently omitted and misrepresented the history of African Americans, not only in New Jersey, but throughout this country. To correct these omissions, all public schools in the state of New Jersey should include in their core curriculum instruction that infuses to all courses on the United States the centuries of contributions in math, science, culture, medicine, industry, government, the, comp the accomplishments by African Americans in the building and development of this country that we call the United States of America. This law applies to all school districts in the state of New Jersey. 
Let's be clear about the Amistad law. It is a law that applies to every school district within the state of New Jersey. What have been some of the challenges that are faced in the, implement, in the implementation of this Amistad law and its instruction? Time only permits me to talk about five challenges. First challenge, most of our teachers have never had a course in African American history during their educational process. Most of our teachers, both majority and minority teachers, have never had a course in African American studies. Second, in our textbooks, which are dated, there's, no, there's not a lot of inclusion of American history. Teachers have to go and research it. It's time consuming. And it being time consuming, uh, a lot of our teachers have become frustrated and they've decided just not to teach it at all because it takes too much time to research that matter because it's not readily available. However, the Amistad website gives a remedy to this situation. The website will provide easy access to these materials on the New Jersey Department of Education website, which has a link to the Amistad curriculum. Thirdly, unless the local boards of education allows use of some of the professional development days under its teacher contract for Amistad instruction, for the inclusion of Amistad instruction, it will lessen the chance that it will be taught. Most, I'm a former teacher. Most of the stuff that's taught, and I call it stuff, that's taught in those professional development days. How many of you are educators here? How many of you are teachers? Okay. Most of those professional development days, uh, for lack of a better term, we could do without. All right, because they're, 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 they're just not relevant. In, in most cases, and I'm going to get some heat for that, but it's the truth. If, if under the teacher's contract, those professional development days included or mandated the teaching of the Amistad curriculum, that would go a long way toward uh, enhancement of learning of our teachers about African American studies. Fourthly, for the last 18 years, the Amistad Commission has held free week-long summer institutes for, Am for, for Amistad teacher training at Montclair State University, and it is now provided at Rowan and Keene Universities here in the state of New Jersey. And it is recommended that the boards of education should take advantage of this free training. Fifth, my fifth challenge, a final challenge is that uh, the implementation of the Amistad curriculum has, uh, has to have continuity. Due to uh, school board election turnover, many of the new people coming on to the board are not for, have not been familiarized with the Amistad curriculum or the, the, the discussions about the Amistad program. And therefore, they do not continue the conversation or the implementation of things like the Amistad program. And it should be pointed out that the Amistad legislation is the law. I keep hammering, hammering that point. It is the law of the state of New Jersey. And the problem is that there is no, within that law, there is no enforcement, there are no sanctions, there are no penalties for noncompliance with uh, that law that are in writing. It's like a toothless tiger, all right? There are no, for not teaching the Amistad law, there are no sanctions on school districts, there are no penalties for not teaching it, there are no uh, written uh, kinds of uh, enforcement in the law. Let's look at the current state of affairs for one minute, and I'm gonna be brief. Newark has a black mayor, it has a black city council president. It has a majority of its board of education members look like you and me, vast majority of people in this room. It has a Hispanic 
school superintendent who we heard eloquently speak about the educational system this morning. Uh, the problem, however, is the lack of participation on the part of parents. Parents need to get involved. They too need to know about the Amistad curriculum and they need to uh, not only familiarize themselves about it, but they need to start pushing that. All right. The major sponsor of the Amistad legislation was Bill Payne. And uh, he's the brother of Donald Payne. And I'm told that he's very disappointed that the Amistad program, which he put to help put together, has not been implemented to date in the state of New Jersey. Uh, it is not the state nor the state's responsibility, but the local board of education has to take the charge and the initiative to infuse this program into the local board of education curriculum throughout the district. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Uh, another question is what role the teachers union will play in getting this curriculum implemented? Teachers who are part uh, of and make up the union also need to be trained in this Amistad curriculum. Some may argue that the state needs to provide the curriculum and the state needs to uh, be taught. The, the state is uh, the, the engine that needs to generate what needs to be taught. Not so. Again, we say that the local board of education members need to provide the basis for the implementation of the Amistad curriculum and the methodology as to how that curriculum should be taught. That is the position of the uh, New Jersey Association of Black Educators. That's the message that I carry forward and bring to you this, this now it's this afternoon. You may ask, okay, what are the next steps? How can we get involved? Well, NJABE uh, recommends a couple of next steps. And one of those next steps is, uh, everyone should ask their local board of education, how are they going to implement this Amistad law? You and I talk to uh, local board of education members and you can ask the question, how are you going to implement the Amistad law? How you, how, what steps are you going to take? Ask the local board of education, how will you educate teachers to do what the law requires? Thirdly, ask students, after you've pushed for this Amistad uh, legislation and its curriculum to be implemented, and we're looking far ahead a little bit. You need to ask your students, your children, when they come home from school, what did you learn that related to the Amistad curriculum? So that that's a way of verifying that the curriculum is actively being, <clears throat> being taught within the schools. But again, it's up to parents and local boards of education to push that curriculum, to push that law, to see that the Amistad curriculum, as we talked about here, is implemented within our school system. All right, as a member of the New Jersey Association of Black Educators, and in conversation with Mr. Harris, he asked me to stress that point, those points. And this is what the uh, Association of Black Educators is standing behind, and we'd like your support behind that. Thank you. Um, let me also mention to everybody that the uh, New Jersey Association of Black Educators was probably started in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. I, I don't forget the exact date, but uh, we represent a coalition f of teachers from kindergarten through the universities and colleges of the state of New Jersey. Um, we thought in coming together annually and, and uh, uh, sharing notes share on methodology and what we were learning, but that's how we were born. We were born, come out of the, the struggle of the, uh, the 1960s. 
Um, have any of you in the room ever attended an Amistad Summer Institute? One person. Two. Okay. Two people. Okay. What I'm going to do now is, in a sense, in introducing um, some current information uh, to everyone, I'm going to give you a little mini uh, Amistad Institute. But also, I will add, uh, a part of it is motivated by questions and challenges that have been thrown in the faces of professors for all of my career, challenging, really, almost the right of Negroes to even exist and have the audacity to think. Somebody wrote a book called The Audacity of Hope. I call it The Tenacity of Audacity. That, that's the book I'm going to write. Everybody. <laughs> But you know, we've had to be audacious uh, and, and relentless. Or for, to fill, so I'm going to take a couple of current statements. of I, If I were going to label this, I would say, number one, uh, it's going to be the history of African-American struggle. It's going to be, what does institutional racism look like? And then what is CRT, critical race theory, and where did it come from? But it's going to be like a mini lesson. Uh, for example, when we were college students, actually, the few books that were written and, and what people thought, I was, here we go, uh, we show up at orientation in 1961, and you know, and there's about a couple hundred of us, and we're wearing jeans and t-shirts and sneaks, and there are four young men in the class that we thought they were really professors because they were wearing business suits, but they said they were freshmen, and uh, so, you know, we, we go over and said, um, uh, who are you guys? He said, we are freshmen like you. And we say, but why are you wearing a suit? They said, in Africa, this is how we honor educators. We dress. And we said, no, that's not what Africa is. In Africa, you got, you got you're primitive people. You eat w Christian missionaries, and you're out of control. And they said, no, that's what you think, but that's not what it is. You know. Then it hit us immediately. Global supremacy, what was it like in those days? And that was the only images and, and we ever got here in America was of primitive people that you colored people in America, you don't want nothing to do with them because they even eat Christian missionaries when we send them over there. They boil them in pots. And we, when we started telling them these stories, they said, where the, excuse my French, where the hell did that stuff come from? I said, that's what we hear, that's education. All right, so we understand that? So for many of us, it's about changing and, and, and educating. Another thing, uh, implicit in all the books that were written, it said that Africans never rebelled against enslavement. And we're, and we're going like, but damn, well, we kill more people in our gang life on the streets, you know, if you follow. Me. I'm, I'm saying that. But nobody ever rebelled against enslavement. So I'm, here we go. So one of the first things I'm going to deal with, I'm starting a little movement among those of us in higher ed for a simple reason. Uh, four years from now will be the year 2026, all right? So as we gather research and more people are diligent with this, this is what I've, I've discovered and any not even new because I didn't discover it, it's just there. I started looking at uh, all the rebellions by enslaved people. And actually it is a scholar, I'll mention a book, uh, Negro Slave Rebellion, written by a white scholar, Her Herbert Apdecker, Negro Slave Revolt. Uh, he was the first person to do all of this documentation because he, re he realized uh, that the white establishment, if you would, doesn't want this kind of information. So now you're going to see all of this right in front of you as I work through this. So this is going to be looking at rebellions that occurred between the 16th century, you know, I'll say right up until almost, the t we can say, the 21st century, if we added that. But in essence... Um, the very first one that I put up there in, uh, in bold print was says Spanish. Uh, in any case, it's in 1521 was the first recorded rebellion. At that point, the English weren't even here yet. The Spanish were here. I just remind everybody about the Spanish settlements. And the very first uh, rebellion in Santo Domingo, which is today, anybody know what Santo Domingo is called today? Dominican, Dominican Republic. Thank you. Was, a very, was an unsuccessful revolt. It wasn't until 1526 uh, in um, San uh, Miguel San Guadalupe, right off an island off of Georgia, that was the first rebellion. So therein lies in the inspiration for me saying, 1526, 500 years later, 
will be four years now, so that I want my colleagues to begin to push the thing 500 years of rebellion against enslavement. That's going to be one of our themes we're going to be pushing, much like the 1619 Project came out to commemorate 400 years of enslavement. I said, but even before we got here, that was only with the English bringing us here. The Spanish had already were bringing Africans in. We've been walking the walk and talking the talk and yanking the cord for close to 500 years, folks. And all this is that follows now is going to be a listing of all those revolts. The first thing that caught my attention when I did it was that we need to understand something. We l are literally within miles of the first ports of debarkation. That is, when the ships would come in, they would be coming in today, the area we would call the Port of Elizabeth, right outside of Lower Manhattan. And so when I first started doing well that research, I found out that that revolt was crushed because the controllers, the enslavers, were, you know, had intimidated the Africans so much that all they were staring in your eyes. They would, if you didn't look back at them, they, they knew you would be guilty. So they were able to break that rebellion because they could kind of like, they put so much trauma into the enslaved. All right, so that's the first model we'll talk about, enslavement and rebellion. We've been rebelling for too long. And this is just by a whole timeline. I indicate which ones were successful and which ones were suppressed to understand that nothing comes easy in this country. Now you see an image to your right. Uh, this is Judge, Judge, Federal Court Circuit Judge A. L uh, Leon Higginbottom. Uh, you know, when you finished law school back in the day before we had computers and, and disk drives, if you were taking all the books you'd have to read to graduate from law school, you could put a shelf on the wall here and you'd have books from that end of the room to this end. When I was in graduate school and had bibliographies for various courses to read, which were like 10 pages long, one of my uh, guys in New York uh, in another apartment, he was a law student at NYU, so he brought me into the room and said he had to spend $2,000 back in the 60s to buy, and he showed me all, because he, he just put brackets on the walls. That's how many law books he had to read. So in that context, Judge Higginbottom wanted to look at the issue of law and race the following way. He wanted to find out how many different laws had been written that actually had the word Negro in it. So in other words, most laws are written to say, uh, like for, implied for the people, to improve you. But there's only one group of people who ever had laws written with their name in it to retard their progress. And this is a very important academic point in a thesis that when, and you'll see, we're gonna call this the immigrant analogy. They often tell us, why can't you all just pull your bootstraps up? Thank you, Doug. Yeah, get it. Mm -hmm. And we say, well, we're the only group of folks who've had laws written to retard us. And that's an important thesis for all of you to remember. And this is the documentation, that particular book, In the Matter of Color. And this is the, uh, another book I'll call to your attention by Dr. Sharshi McIntyre. She found that even when a few Africans got free, that's when they started all these little codes to really enslave and criminalize the freed population. If you looked at a white person in the eye, you get locked up. If you spit on the sidewalk or they accuse you, you get locked up. If you didn't walk off of the sidewalk when that white person was coming, you get locked up. Black codes, Black codes that's all it was. Emmett Till, whether she, he looked, smiled, grinned, whatever. You know, it was just too much, he gets killed. Anybody know who that person is? <laughs> sitting, I'll, you, I'll give you a hint, he's sitting on the uh, steps of the law school that Barack Obama attended, Harvard University. This is the godfather of critical race theory. Critical race theory that you're going to hear a lot about. We've got white parents all over the country now saying, we don't want critical race theory taught in, in school, and it's not. It's only taught at law schools. Bell. Der Derek Bell. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, so critical race theory is only taught in law schools. So it is not taught outside of that. And it's only about showing most law students would think that Lady Liberty is blind, that justice is equal. And he wants you to say, he says, hell no, <laughs> only when it comes to black folks. And he shows them all these laws written with the word Negro in it to say, look, got it? And they get it. 
Um, so I share that with you because we are dealing with now this, this, this avalanche of negativity. They don't want critical race theory taught, which it will it'll never be taught on that level. It's only taught in law schools. They don't want sexual orientation material taught. This is the current rollout of neo-racism. This is the face of his most, uh, his famous book, uh, that he wrote that contains this information. It's called Faces at the Bottom of the Well for Documentation. And I've already mentioned the, um, the immigrant analogy, and I have a few quotes here below the flag. I have this image of, you know, Lady Liberty and the American flag and people, you know, coming to America for freedom, for prosperity. They're bringing their children. Uh, Dr. King says, it's okay to tell a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. But it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. This is America's, this is Dr. King continuing, America's opportunity to help bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots. The question is whether America will do it. This is nothing new, and there's nothing new about poverty. Poverty, by the way, was technically defined by the federal government when I was a junior in, in college, 1963. All we knew was we were all poor, never used the word poverty, but nobody treated, that family never got wrapped up in the concept of poor. We made it happen. You know how it is. A woman could take a, a chicken and feed 20 people. We know all about that. Out of love, out of love. Amen, sis. We hold these truths to be, so I asked my students, where did this, what's the root of this quote? Where does it come from? They, they, they said, from his speech. I said, no. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Then King goes on to say, but if a man doesn't have a job and an income, which hopefully education helps to improve that, whether it's technical education or education moving on to the arts and humanities, he has neither life nor liberty nor the possibility for the pursuit of happiness at all if he just merely exists. Here is an, an image then we look at, what, what is structural racism and how complex? So I believe, I use the, uh, the, mo the something that comes out of Asian philosophy which says a picture can be worth a thousand words. So one way that I attempt to do a lot of instruction is by giving pictures and also this generation is a bit more visual than others. Uh, fundamentally, this expl it, 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 it says it all. If you look at the, uh, the levels going from colonialism, and by the way, I hope you all do know that we have 50 states and a number of territories. And so you might say, what is a territory? I said, well, only colonial empires who go into other people's lands and exploit them and get their natural resources. Then I'll ask my classes, what is the closest colonial territory to the US? They don't know, it's Puerto Rico. So then you look at the steps. Co the colonialism is an attitude and belief system. Then you build the economic system of capitalism. Then you put a class structure. There's a book written, I tell my white students, I said, you know, you know you're being shafted by your own people. They said, no, we're white, we're privileged. I said, read this book and we'll, have the, we'll continue the discussion. Written by Dr. Eisenberg, the book is called White Trash. White Trash. It explains from the beginning of America how many men who could never be rich in Europe knew they could come to this new country and be rich. The 1%, as soon as they got a little bit of wealth, they passed local codes. Said the only people who can vote are those who own property. The only property you had would be Africans. So therefore, when it came to early voting in America, no white woman could vote. Only white men who own property. 1% of the population, 99% of all of the white men could not vote. That's why, I, then I said, I want all you white students to sit in a, um, a circle and talk about what, what you just learned. And how do you need to liberate other white people from the mythology that all of you are equal, when this is how you are literally seen. Then look, you look at the fourth level, legal structure, then the distribution of privileges. Then there's, at the top, there's something called scientific racism. You know, the father of gynecology, if you, if you were in med school, you would say, and you say, great. All the women who have their issues, and you say, we, that's, a, that's a good man. He helped form this new science. He learned his earlier days, he experimented on the bodies of black females. On, when, when white women found that out in New York City, they wanted his statue taken down from Central Park. Then you look at 
the five areas that hold the whole system together, from exploitation to violence, which still continues against black bodies. And friends, that ends our presentation. We now have the floor open for Q&A. Ron and I would be more than happy to answer as best we can any questions that you can pose. And we have a good 10 minutes or so. Yes, sir. On that last slide of where you had the commentary on the history. Yes, sir. There was a comment about very recently that race could not be included as a factor in the assignment of students in school. Yes. And I'm trying to understand, was that, was the effect of that uh, to increase segregation or to reduce segregation? I think to reduce it. And, um, but, you know, once again, also, it, it, I was going to say, if you look at history, the ball bounces in different, in different ways. Uh, busing even comes up at, you know, a certain point in time as a remedy. Um, uh, at another point in time, they even take white teachers from predominantly white schools and have them teaching at historically uh, black uh, neighborhoods. So this is a very, very mixed bag. There is no one way to comprehend it, and there's no one answer. And there's no simple answer, and that's the probably best way to put that. I have three questions. Mm -hmm. um, where can we find more information regarding the availability of the Institute and the um, NJ Black Educators Association? There is, a, uh, there is a website I can give to you. Has it been updated? And do non um, K-12 educators have access to the information? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me see. Hold on for a second. While second. Ron is looking for that, I'll just mention okay. that uh, the the commission is be, the. Okay. It is no. It is it is NJ Association of Black Educators dot org. NJ Association of Black Educators dot org. All one word. All right, I'll say it again. It's NJ Association of Black Educators dot org. And if any of you really want to uh, contact the president of current president of NJ ABE, I can give you the phone number if you like. All right, it is 973 5182990. Nine seven three five one eight two nine nine zero, but I urge you to go on that website, the NJ Association of Black Educators dot org, and there's a wealth of information there. I'm an educator with forty years of experience, and uh, I've taught in black districts, and I've also taught in white districts, but I didn't have any black student. Mm -hmm. um, to the point, um, how can we, we don't control the mechanism of education. So how can we force anyone to do anything in any school district? I, what, 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 what vehicles or what things can we do? Uh, because uh, even when I taught my colleagues were black, they, they never, they wouldn't teach it because they didn't have to. And there was nothing forcing them to teach Amistad, nothing forcing them to teach uh, trail of tears of, of uh, genocide of Native Americans, nothing forcing them to teach. This is, this is people by complexion. Mm -hmm. And forget about the white people teaching it. Mm -hmm. They would mention, the, as the names you discussed, this, you know, the trigger, the trigger names that all people are supposed to know about black history. And then they would say, I've overheard them say, don't, uh, white people tell the class, don't ever say I didn't teach you about black history. And that was one day, one session. And, and just the percentages, 88% of all educators in this country are white. Right. And when I worked in the white district, they, they forced me to teach. That's why I left. But I was there in the white district taking a rest, like most of my white colleagues come into and I was born and raised in North, and I've worked in East Orange, Orange. I've worked in uh, 
uh, uh, Plainfield, Patterson. I've worked in Sea Caucus, worked in uh, Boundbrook and, and Madawan. And not because I couldn't keep a job, but because I got involved in technology in the 80s. And so therefore, there were no labs that I could teach uh, computer science in North, East Orange, everything, a place like that. So that's how I ended up in Madawan, Greenbrook, Sea Caucus, and places like that. Uh, so I tried to get the curriculum in the school, the black school, but because the white colleagues knew they didn't want black kids to have computer skills in the 80s, they took the lab that I designed, they took the curriculum that I wrote, and they changed the, the, the lab, which was going to be a lab, into a senior class lab. So See. that's how I ended up in a white district. Me and three other lab teachers had my own uh, room with 20 computers in it teaching Cobalt, Fortran, Pascal, and other languages. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. control the mechanism of education. And, and like Dr. Drury said, we have too much psychological damage from, from the history of slavery. We don't even want to send our kids to black private schools. Or, as you say, University of Delaware, I'm a proud graduate of a school up the road from you That's Cheney State College. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. where that was, that was my epiphany, going, going to change, because uh, that's when I found out that black people could do things. Amen. And Amen. that was busted up because here I am down here on Lock Street now, but in the, in the, in the revolt of 67, the, the, the National Guardsmen had me and my brother right down here on the corner of Lock Street with them ones pointed at us. But God, I have to mention God in my story because I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about what God did. Amen. God had them turn their backs and me and my brother disappeared into the darkness. Well, mm -hmm. the See, they're in, they're in. And unless we believe that we can teach each other. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't control the mechanisms of our ed education. But, sir, therein lies the problem. You know, it's, it's education of the mind, okay, and teaching of that history that nobody wants to teach, okay. Now, you just said something. Prior to, as I stated, prior to 2002, there's no mechanism for, there was no law for teaching African American history in this state. And even after the law was passed in 2002, right up to 2022, where we are right now, we are still pushing to get the Amistad curriculum implemented in every school district within the state of New Jersey. So, you know, I agree with you. There was no, there was no emphasis, there was no move, there was no push to get the kind of history that you and I know need to be taught in the school system, all right? So that was the big problem. You also have the problem that of denial. There are some people who look like you and me that don't want our history taught. They don't even acknowledge that we are from the continent of Africa, all right? As Malcolm said, some of us left our minds in Africa, okay? Um, and it's a shame because We've got a rich, a very rich, and a very rewarding history, okay? And our contribution to this country and around the world has been phenomenal. Okay? Ma'am, go so, ahead. With that comment about um, people who look like us not wanting to teach the um, Amistad curriculum, the comment said that I've heard both from educators and from children right. is they feel that it is traumatizing to have curriculum that is taught to them where our life began as enslaved people. And so my question, because I haven't seen the Amistad curriculum, mm -hmm. does it talk about the rich history and culture that we had before we stepped You have to. Story? You have to start so, talking about the kingdoms I mean, in I, Africa. I know that, and yeah. I know that in Not having access to, to that, that information. Curriculum is that the people that 
uh, in school districts are telling me that it starts with enslavement. I'm like, it can't. No. It can't possibly no, it start can't. with enslavement. No. And so who is teaching the teachers right. exactly. about the, exactly. the curriculum? And that curriculum and so, starts in Africa, starts with Africa, and that's what needs to be taught. That's why the summer institutes at so Montclair State, Keene, and it Rowan. Needs to be open to more than just the K-12 oh, education. Yes, they are, yes, they are. They are. Okay. They are. They are. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. When you talk about, um, you know, teachers not wanting to teach it, I think it's all about leadership. I think it's about making sure that your superintendent supports, because I get pushed back every single day. Correct. And I, I told my husband last night, I'm tired of fighting, but this is what mm. I do. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have to be sure that we are putting not only, it's, you know, when you talk about Amistad, teachers only focus on social studies. Right. Amistad is English, math, math history, history, science, science every across the board. Exactly. Curriculum standards. The, the right. So it's all about leadership and making sure that whoever's serving in that in that role. My title is assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. So I make sure that my team is providing that professional development because we actually have a day coming up November eighth. My brother is funny and said it doesn't matter, but it does. It does. Um, for what? us, we are making sure that whatever we're putting in is you know we have culture responsive teaching of math, culture responsive teaching and social studies. Amistad, AAPI, because now we have the Asian American history. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. that is being taught. And it's not going to happen over a year. This is only my second year in the position. Right. But it's something that I know my five-year plan is to make sure all teachers have this have access to it. You've got to see it in those lesson plans. You've yes. got to see it in those yes. weekly yes. lesson plans. Exactly. You've got to see that something Amistad-based is in the teacher's lesson plan. And if it's not, you gotta ask the question, why not? Exactly. Right, right now, right now, to be honest with you, it is on a very limited basis. All right? Excuse me? I can't hear you. Is there a list of school that implemented? Um, there's a very short list. That's why New Jersey Association of Black Educators is putting this push on. Just like that defensive line for the Philadelphia Eagles, we're trying to put a bull rush on this so, what so that it gets implemented in districts within the state of New Jersey, all school districts. Within 20 years, five districts? Approximately, I'll say, I'll, I'll just pick five. From last, uh, the commission now has a new director of the uh, Board of Commissioners. I'll pass along to her immediately. If they could publish that on their website, that's not illegal. I'll ask her to do that for you. Right. The other thing I was going to ask is that, um, the other thing I do, I, I want everybody to know this. Uh, the other thing I do at the university beyond teaching is that I'm the director of the Martin Luther King Leadership Program. I offer 20 scholarships every year for about $6,000 for the best servant leaders I can find throughout the world who want to come to Seton Hall. I wanted to share that. Second thing I'd like to share with all of you, and you can send me an email later. I have a few cards, but just, you, see my, you saw my name earlier, just get my name. And um, uh, every day on MLK Day, which is a holiday for many people, I used to do a, a uh, breakfast on campus, and just for the students, we'd invite high school kids up. After Donald Trump, the 44th POTUS, uh, was elected, I asked for permission to shift from breakfast to anti-racism training. I now offer a one-credit course with CEU credits. It's an all-day piece. Uh, I mention that to you because what I'm thinking about doing and listening to this is that we have some of our best professors come in and do m various pieces from how the Bible is used, uh, misused to support white supremacy but uh, we could probably put a heavy unit in a couple of hours in the afternoon on the history of Africa 
as far as that's concerned. As a matter of fact, I'm even thinking about uh, the NJ, uh, EA convention. Maybe we could get some professors and we can put a module in there also. I wanted you all to know that. I'm going to do a little marketing right now. Um, I urge you, and I know Mr. Harris would endorse this, anybody who wishes or is not, who's an educator, is not a member of NJABE, come and find out what we're about. All right, you can leave your name with me, all right? Uh, I'll have Mr. Harris personally reach out to you. Uh, we meet once a month, and we need your ideas, all right? We need your input into how we can get this Amistad curriculum implemented in the school districts within the state of New Jersey. How can we influence legislators? Some of you have some marvelous ideas within you that we haven't heard yet. So I ask you two things. One, if you have any lingering questions in the time remaining, please jot them down on a piece of paper, leave them with me, and we'll get the answers for you. Two, if you so desire, uh, leave your name and your, uh, your email address or your cell phone number. We will reach out to you if you're interested in becoming a member of NJABE or finding out, just out of curiosity, what NJABE is all about and what we are attempting to do. All right, I'd be glad to have your name take your telephone number, and we'll do the outreach to you. Thank you. And our last, my last comment is if any of you ha have any groups, whether it's your school groups or community groups, if you ever would like to bring a group of students up on a college campus, I would be more than happy to host you for, say, about three hours. Uh, we do a tour of the campus. I would then have our MLK scholars talk about where they are from, why they want to be teachers and doctors and lawyers or uh, whatever it may be and so forth. I'd be, so just come up and grab one of my cards and I'd be more than happy uh, to be your host at Seton Hall, okay? Thank you. We thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.